study, we're, um, we've been looking at the book of Ecclesiastes and um, we're up to chapter 4 and the, the author starts off with oppression, which is kind of not particularly nice, is it? Oppression and uh, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. And, and, and there's a couple of ways of looking at this word oppression. There's one where, where people are oppressed for us to climb the ladder of success and to gain, we, we, we put people down and, and we oppress people and, and they're always down, the, the, the disadvantaged and uh, we're part of that, we, we, we're part of, of putting people down. And then the other side of oppression is when we try and climb the ladder and we don't actually get there and then we get oppressed because the burden and the anxiety that comes upon us because we're not achieving in the society that we live in and we want to gain and get there but we don't actually get there, and we think it's always better up there, big is beautiful. And then we, in our modern world, begin to get oppressed and down. And then I was talking to Ian this morning and Jan, I think, and, and we were just talking about churches and people we've met before. And then I realized that, you know, the sad thing in churches and congregations is that Things go wrong when Christians meet together. And we can all relate to stories, can't we, of churches where fine churches and fine leaders have gone down the hill and they've gone down the tubes. And we were just chatting about various churches over the years. And I think there's a time when the oppression comes on the congregation as well. When, they, when they've been led wrong or they've had legalistic teaching or false teaching. So there's a there's another kind of oppression that comes upon the church. So hopefully this morning we won't leave here all oppressed and depressed. So let's try and be a little bit excited about God's word. But also let's look at the truth of it, that, that this oppression, I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors and they have no comforter. I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. And this too is meaningless, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And ultimately, if we're chasing after the wind, or oh, as that verse 4 says, all the toil and achievement spring from one person's envy of another. Isn't that amazing how we get caught up into society and what's happening and ultimately there is no satisfaction. And we, you know, we all live in this fast, modern, ultra world and we're constantly comparing ourselves with others and we want to keep up with those Joneses. We want to look good. We want to look younger or exciting or achieve and, and be something. And when we don't get there, we get this feeling of oh, we've missed out or we, we haven't made it or anxiety or oppression or negative feelings come. And before long, everything's hopeless and meaningless. There's no comfort and there's nowhere for us to go. You know, I read the other week that in America, the highest, the suicide rate, the highest suicide rate is amongst wealthy, middle-class white men. How can that be? They have everything. And so in their eyes, they seemingly have everything, but something goes wrong and their world crumbles. And now children in America, that as, as young as 10, are being diagnosed with depressive-type disorders. How do we allow this to happen? And verse 4 says, All that toil and achievement, spring from one person's envy of another. Don't we come to church and grab hold of life and the understanding of life? And as Kathy said this morning, it is your will, it is your will, it is your will. God cannot grab hold of you all. We need to, the will to desire to love God and keep on loving God and make God first in our lives. It's meaningless, springing from man's envy of his neighbor. You know, there was a, a saying that went around a few years ago that we're buying things that we don't need that we can't afford to impress people we don't even like. <laughs> All this information, this overload. When we lived in Germany the last few months, you know, Germany's 12 hours behind. We'd wake up in the middle of the night 
and you've got to check your email, don't you? But someone in New Zealand might have sent you an email. How ridiculous is that? I told Sue not to do it. <laughs> but you know, you know, it's crazy, isn't it? We walk around with our phones. We've got to just check our emails because at 2 o'clock in the morning, someone in New Zealand might have sent Ross a real exciting email and for some reason I have to read it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Then you can't go back to sleep because it's a silly email or telling you off or something. You know, I was, uh, when I was in the Air Force, I went to, uh, to Afghanistan with the Army as a chaplain and we were living in this little village and um, the village had nothing. They had hardly any food. Uh, there were no beggars on the street because it's pointless begging. No one's got anything to give you anything. They had no power, no water, no sewage. And I used to go in a couple of times a week and teach English. And, and all they, the young people, and that's probably from about 8 to 18, wanted to learn English. But the other thing they wanted is they wanted a computer. And they all thought if they could get a computer and a generator to run it, they've made it in life. Instead of worrying about the fact they had no running water, sewage or electricity. They wanted to go from here to here because the West had told them that's what they need in life, that they have to get out of this rut and the only way to do it is to get a computer. And it was really sad, but that's for these young people. That's what they thought, that they were modelling themselves of what was happening out there and it was so great and if they could get a computer, they would be, be influenced by, the, by this Western world and it would help them get out of their, their poverty. They weren't worried about hygiene or anything like that or even running water or a decent toilet or, or anything like that. But, you know, if we're not careful, the influence of the world comes into the church and begins to fashion us in the church. And, and before long, we, we, are, we are dictated to, to become too relevant in our world and, and the church doesn't want it do anything or say anything or that's going to upset people and we don't talk about judgment or we don't talk about hell because we want to be acceptable and we, we don't want to be missing out. We want to be relevant and the world comes in and impacts the church. And then, you know, Ecclesiastes tells us that we, we're looking in the wrong places, we're searching in the wrong places and before long everything is meaningless. And, you know, to answer Ecclesiastes... The answer is to grab hold of the Christian faith, to believe the Christian faith, to understand your faith, understand your Lord and your God, and move forward on that. When, again, when we were in Germany, they had some workers there from the Ukraine doing some work, and these men had come to faith. Uh, when communism had fallen, down, fallen, and I asked one of them, I said, how did you, why, how did you come to faith? And he said when the wall came down and communism started falling, that the Americans came in and they bought the, the, the gospel and Christianity. And they said under communism we had nothing. We had no hope. We had oppression. We had depression. There was nothing there. And then they said when you're confronted with the, with the Bible, when you're confronted with the message of hope, of salvation, of Jesus Christ, of the glory of the Lord, they said something happens and hope comes into your life. Isn't it such a simple message? And these men who lived under the oppression for so long, the message of life, the reality of life comes in. Jesus is revealed to them. The Holy Spirit touches their life, and they get born again into hope. And a very simple question, why, is answered with a very simple answer. To know Jesus gives us hope. And I guess it's hard for us to understand. If you haven't lived under that regime and that oppression, you can't really understand what it is to have that hope. But what was following on from that story, which was quite interesting, was Ukraine's always been a part of Russia, and as you know, they're trying to get it back. David Pierce, who started Steiger, he, now he travels around a lot of these countries. And he came back, and he was, he would, um, was telling us about meeting with a whole lot of Russian pastors, and I think, I think communism fell about 15 or 16 or 17 years ago. And he said, what's interesting, talking with these Russian pastors, they said that the, the communism fell, the, the gospel came in, people got excited, people started coming to church, they found hope, they found life, and, and the churches were, were really buzzing and humming over the last 15 years ago. But you know what they said? You know, they, they said, the problem is we got too comfortable. We bought it all in, we got insular, 
And two years ago, the Russian government, because of terrorism, said you're not allowed to meet out in the street, you're not allowed to have outdoor concerts, you're not allowed to do anything out on the street. And these Russian pastors realised that they'd missed the point. They'd got so comfortable in their Christianity, they'd bought it inside. They said, if we'd have kept our faith out in the street where we could have concerts and we were meeting out there and people were coming, when the government tried to say you can't meet outside, it would have been harder for the government to close them down. Really interesting point, isn't it? But because they, they bought it in, like we all do, we got comfortable They said it's so much harder now to go out in the streets and evangelize and and preach. And if they'd have been doing it, if it had been a regular occurrence, it would have been harder for the government to close them down. And we're like that, aren't we? In our our world, you know, we get comfortable and we've brought the church into into our, our great buildings, which we need, and we've forgotten to go out. We've got too comfortable. And the only way for us as individuals, the only way for us to answer that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love, and that's, you know, that's what Kathy's saying this morning, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Your fir- the first commandment, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstances, put God first in your life. John Ortberg's an author and pastor in North America, and he was interviewing a gentleman, Dallas Willard. I'm sure some of you heard, would have heard of Dallas Willard, an old theologian. He's written a book on spiritual disciplines, uh, a very um, well-known man, though he passed away last year. And John Ortberg asked him, he said, how do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? And old Dallas Willard, he thinks it over, and he said, you know, he said, anything... Do not allow anything to distract you from God. Very simple answer, isn't it? Craig Vernal from Bethlehem Baptist says, do the basics well. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and don't let anything distract. That's how our church, how the congregation works, how it relates when all of us get together and we're all in one accord All one mind, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. When I first met my wife, Sue, we were in the Air Force together down to Hakia, and uh, we started going out. Sue was this Christian girl. I was the non-Christian guy. Had no understanding of God or church or faith. We'd been going out for a little while, and then Sue said, made a comment. She said, I'll never love you as much as I love God. And I I didn't know God. I thought, who cares? I said, it had meant absolutely nothing to me, but she said, I'll never love you as much as I love God. And she made it really clear that she was choosing God first, which is a really important point I found out later on. In life, but she would have kicked me out. She would have kicked this tall, dark, and handsome guy out (laughs) and put God first in her life. Well, in fact, she tells me she didn't like me the first few months anyway. I was an idiot, I was silly. She didn't like the bull cream in my hair. Yeah, but let's be people who put God first in our lives. And I mentioned a few weeks ago about Bill Hybels and when he was a young pastor 30 years ago and people would bring their, their families to church three out of four Sundays. And now with a church, he's got about 20-something thousand people. He was saying that now people bring their children to church in America 1.3 times out of four. Isn't that a sad statistic? from three out of four times 30 years ago to 1.3 times out of four. What are we saying to our families? What are we saying to society when we're saying that church is not that relevant or important on a Sunday? Isn't that incredible? Isn't it amazing how, how we just kind of let things slowly, slowly dissipate and everything else becomes important? 
instead of our worshipping the Lord on Sunday and teaching families and our community. We need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our spirit. We need to guard our church. We need to guard our congregation about the oppression of life and things that will come in and, and detract us. I, um, I mentioned also about the Moravians who moved from Moravia before the Reformation in Czechoslovakia and under, persecu- the, yeah, yeah, under persecution and they were kicked out, they were being killed, they were being just per- totally persecuted. And this, the Moravian movement started with John Huss and he'd written a lot and he was eventually burnt at a stake. But these were incredibly Holy Spirit-filled people and they were not going to give in to the Catholic regime and the Catholic persecution. So they had to move for safety and they ended up in a place in Germany. And um, there was a count there by the name of Nicholas Zinzendorf. This is in the uh, 18th century and he was quite a noble gentleman. And uh, his father died young. He was brought up in a, a Christian home. And he held to his faith right throughout university. And he got, got together with a bunch of five other uh, people. They called themselves the Mustard Seed Group. And they put, wrote a, a Confessions of Faith. And their objectives in life for these five men was to go through their whole lives with these three objectives, to be kind to people, to be true to Christ, to send the gospel to the world. Have a basic faith and a basic Christianity. So he's a very rich and and noble man. He heard about the Moravians. He allowed them to come and live in his community. Of uh, 300, 300 people came and they developed community. They built community and everything was going really, really well. But you know what happens when a whole lot of, when a bunch of Christians get together? You know what happens? We all start arguing and bickering. And sadly, this incredible Holy Spirit inspired group, false teaching came in, false leadership came in, and it started to crumble, and false doctrine came in, and, and this incredible group was in danger of falling apart. And he was outside looking in. He didn't live in the community. It was on his land. And he eventually brought his family down from their big flash. If you can imagine, big flash manor house. They came down. They lived in this village. And he began to restore discipline and teaching to this group of 300 people. And that involved a lot of forgiveness, a lot of repentance, and a lot of healing. And this went on for a period of time. People left and you know, you can imagine, most people have been through it in the church, the sadness and the oppression and, and anxiety and churches and everything, that's discord, basically. So this went on, he healed it, he brought healing to this group of people, and then one day they had a prayer meeting. And this is the exciting part. In 1727, August the 13th, let me read what happened at that prayer meeting. The heavens opened and the power and the glory of God descended. The sense of God's presence went off the scale beyond words, beyond description, beyond understanding. The Spirit of God came like a windstorm, mighty, rushing, irresistible. The love and holiness of God touched them like a fire stream, heartwarming, dangerous life, brandy. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being a church and a congregation of people where healing, repentance, forgiveness is so strong and so powerful and the Holy Spirit descends? I'm going to read it again. Close your eyes if you want to. Just soak in that. Understand it. The heavens opened. The power and the glory of God descended. The sense of God's presence went off the scale beyond words beyond description, beyond understanding. The Spirit of God came like a windstorm, mighty, rushing, irresistible. The love and the holiness of God touched them like a fire stream, heartwarming, dangerous, life-branding. Amen. The Spirit of Pentecost hit the small community of people. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that incredible? That's our Lord and that's our God. That's just so, when healing comes, when repentance comes, when forgiveness comes, when our stony, cold hearts get broken and we humble ourselves and get before each other and ask for forgiveness, love and healing and the arrogance and the pride and the ego goes outside. Billy Graham in 1954, he went to England 
to evangelize England. An Anglican priest stood up and basically condemned what he was doing and predicted it would be a failure. They even put and they even lodged in Parliament a complaint about Billy Graham's visit to England. Christians, eh? Two million people attended his rallies and a spiritual awakening was born. Two weeks after this Moravian movement of God, 24 men and women got together and they decided that they would pray. They would pray 24-7. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. Every hour of the day there was someone praying. Every hour of the day, every day of the week. And do you know what happened? No one told them to stop. They prayed for a hundred years. And out of that prayer movement, they started sending missionaries all around the world. Now you have to realize this is the 1700s. If you're going to be a missionary and going somewhere in the world, you're going to jump on a rickety old boat, take six weeks or eight weeks or whatever to get where you're going. It's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. But the spiritful group of people, they wanted to take the word around the world, and they sent groups to a lot of the slave colonies, and they sent a group, to, I think it was St. Thomas's Island in the Caribbean. They sent out 18 missionaries. 13 of them were killed. They sent out another 11 Six of them were killed, and they hadn't heard from anyone for, for a long period of time. So old Count Zinzendorf jumps on a ship with a couple of people, and he said, well, go out and see what's going on. So he arrived in this colony. There was no one around. There was nothing. And then he found a group of 600 slaves worshiping the Lord. But do you know what happens when a bunch of Christians get together? They bicker and argue. And you know what happened? A Dutch priest got so jealous of what the missionaries were doing, he trumped up some charges and the missionaries were thrown in prison. But that didn't, the slaves would come to the prison and they'd worship and sing outside the doors anyway. Isn't that incredible? What happens? And then Zinzendorf, he arrived and he had such mana and power that he got them released out of prison anyway. But this started from repentance and healing and forgiveness and love, the power of God descended. Two weeks later, an incredible prayer meeting starts, and over a period of this time, they, this community of about 300 people sent 1,000 missionaries throughout the world. Incredible, eh? When we start praying and believing, the church grows under persecution when there's fear there's no hope, there is no future. But in the West, we're so comfortable, we have so much wealth, we're never satisfied, and that impinges upon our relationship with God and, 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 and the rich and famous, the glitz and glamour of life becomes so attractive to us. Our Christianity becomes so comfortable. And, you know, Christianity, I really believe it's not designed to compete it is not designed to compete with the rich and famous and the glitz and glamour of the world. There is no competition. Christianity has already won. And I think we get into this place, we're competing against the world. I don't believe we are. I think if we stand firm, if we pray firm, if we believe, support one another and love one another, Christianity will always win. But let's not get to a place where we put them together side by side and say, oh, we're competing against the world. Sure, in the world's eyes we are. In the non-church world's eyes we probably are. But in the Christian world we are not competing against it. God is not designed, his Christianity is not designed to compete with that. All he's asking us is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and mind. To humble ourselves and to love God. That there's no distraction. And, you know, today we live in a place which there's heaps of distractions. There's heaps of ways to take our eyes off Christ. But let's not be a church that does that. And don't allow the compromise to come in. So very basically, how do we keep our eyes on Jesus? A lifestyle, a lifestyle dedicated to Christ. Put time aside every day. Find a plan. Find a dream. Find a dream, a vision. 
a desire, a hobby, something you like doing, something that draws your personality in a closer relationship with Jesus. God made you so special. He's given you so many gifts and talents. You might like, like walking. You might like art or anything like that. Find something that you really enjoy doing and find God in that place, God in that space. I was talking to Scotty this morning. He's a real interesting guy. Some of the occultist-type festivals Scotty goes to, you know, he goes with the power of God and the blessing of God, and he sees incredible, miraculous things happening because God has drawn him into that place, and God has made him so special to be there. So just find something, find anything that really floats your boat. Always meet God with a pen and paper. Be outward looking. Let's be a church, a congregation of people who are praying outward, looking outward, not looking inward all the time and trying to work it all out inside, but actually pray for our neighbours. Find someone in society, in our friends or neighbourhood. Let's not be people of guilt, of shame, of condemnation, of, of oppression, causing oppression to other people or being oppressed. You know, I think that's some, one of the things that probably holds most of us in the church back, the past where we, we live under these words, I can't possibly do it, I did this, I don't deserve it, I did this or that. Let's let that go. The joy of the Lord, how strong is that? How powerful is that? The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. Stop and slow down, be content. Choose this day who you will serve. You know, Ecclesiastes is such a real book. For me, it drills down deep into each one of us. It shows us who we really are. It shows us the reality of life, and it, it really kicks us along. And, you know, it oozes relevance. Ecclesiastes oozes answers. It oozes common sense. But more than that, it springboards us, all of us, into the pre from the present-day situation into the future. It reminds us not to be stuck into meaningless stuff. Look for true meaning. You know, the only way we can try and find true meaning is to really know ourselves, to love ourselves, to accept ourselves, accept who we are. And the only way we can do that is to know the Creator, to know the one who wrote the Ecclesiastes, to know the one who made us so special, who breathed the spirit of life into us. Then we can say, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Then we can say, the one who is in you is greater than he that is in this world. Hallelujah. Loved by God. Ecclesiastes springs us into that future hope. It says, don't get stuck here. You know, the New Testament answers Ecclesiastes. And this is where we need to, you grab hold of the Old Testament, you grab hold of Ecclesiastes, and you find in the New Testament the answer is that the, the author of Ecclesiastes, he's trapped, he's trapped in the spiral, spiral downward, total hopelessness. And then Matthew chapter 5, it says, blessing, you are blessed people. No matter what's happening, you know, the world would tell us, you know, how can you be blessed when, when you're mourning? How can you be blessed when you hunger, um, when things are going wrong? I'll read it properly. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you, because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. You are blessed when things are going wrong. You are blessed when you're in a bad place. Let's not be stuck. Let's not be living in oppressive times. When it does get hard, it does get, the road is rocky, it is difficult at times, but let's be a people who read Matthew chapter 5 and understand that we are blessed in everything that is happening. You know, I, I mentioned the Moravian movement and the prayer that they had for a hundred years. In 2000, 
is a night guy by the name of Peter Greig from England and God was challenging him about his prayer life and him and his wife and daughter they went on an excursion throughout Europe praying to find out what God is saying to him and he came back and through various instances and what was happening he started a prayer movement called 24-7 has anyone heard of that? it's gone throughout the whole world and he, he wrote a book called Red Moon Rising if you ever want to read it about how God instigated this incredible prayer movement and he's based a lot of it on the whole Moravian prayer and what was, was happening. And, and this whole movement now has gone global and it's just throughout the world, people praying 24-7. And you read his book, people come into this 2 o'clock in the morning to pray and they meet God, they meet the Holy Spirit, they meet the presence of God and prayers are answered and it, it's quite a neat, fascinating book to read. It's great stuff. Prayer is incredible. Prayer is our foundation. Prayer is the basic meeting place with God. But you know this guy, Peter Greig, he's written another book called God on Mute. Mute? M-U-T-E. God on Mute. Engaging the Silence of Unanswered Prayer. And he's written this book about his journey with his wife who has brain cancer. See, she's had an operation she has brain cancer, she has epileptic fits throughout the day, they have two young boys. And he's written a book about the reality of life, of unanswered prayer. But you see, he talks about the blessing of God in the book, that we don't live in oppression. And his wife talks a little bit in the book as well. You know, that is the wholeness of God. That is what God does for us. And I was talking to a gentleman last week. He's got two young children who are terribly ill. They will always be ill. There is no way that those children at this stage from medical science will be healed. They will always be ill. And they are up from 5 in the morning to 11 at night looking after these children. And I said to him, how do you cope? I said, I have no way of understanding how you cope. And he said, God's amazing. God's incredible. He said, through this whole journey, everything that we do, God is with us. Every, every time of, of hardship, of stress, of anxiety, he said, God is with us. I was so surprised that is the answer. And I know, I haven't seen him for a while, I know him quite well. And I said, how do you keep going with your two young children? And he said, God's incredible. That was his first words. There was no hesitancy. Because God is amazing. There's no hesitancy. So let's not be a people of oppression or despondency. Let's be a people of forgiveness, of love. And let's look to the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God. Let's look to what happened in the 18th century on August the 13th, 1726, when the Holy Spirit inspired and came on a group of people who had, who had hated each other's guts for a while. Who were, There was dissent. And I'm not saying that's relevant for this church at all. But there was dissension and there were problems. There was false teaching. And then with forgiveness and love and healing, God's Spirit came and touched their lives. You know, in the Bible, there's 90 verses about music. There's 375 verses about praying. Let's be a people who pray. So as you leave here today, leave here with an attitude. It is well with my soul. It is well with it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you sing that song here? Yeah. It is well, it is well with... Do you want to jump on the piano? We'll rush through it. No. <laughs> it's all right, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sing. Hallelujah. Life is not meaningless when you live in the New Testament community of our living God. Life is not meaningless. But Ecclesiastes pulls us up, you know. Ecclesiastes springboards us into the future. And we'll take the offering up. Yep, let's take the offering up. Sometime we'll take the offering up. But let's leave here excited today that God is good and prayer is incredibly, incredibly important. Love is incredibly important. Forgiveness is incredibly important. Let's love one another. Okay, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made, Lord. Father, it is good to meet in your presence, Lord. Father, your Holy Spirit meets with us.
Father, Lord, as Kathy said, it is our will, Lord, surrendered to you, Father. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much. Father, we thank you that you meet us at our point of need, Lord. Father, nothing is too difficult for you. And Lord, we thank you for that, for that Moravian movement, Lord, where, where they prayed for a hundred years. I thank you for Peter Grieg and, and his wife, Sammy, and Lord, Lord, the turmoil they lived through. But Father God, they know, Lord, that you are God and you are King. And Lord, you bring blessing every day. Lord, whatever situation we're in, however we are, Lord, we look to you to bring blessing, Father. For those who mourn will be blessed, Lord. We will be comforted. Father, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.